Hey everybody, it's Pastor Megan Rohr at Grace Lutheran in San Francisco, and you're watching Bible Study That Doesn't Suck. Um, our worship is every every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. You can learn more about us at www.gracesf.com. Um, and this week, we have a special service on Saturday, 3 p.m., um, in person or on our live stream. If you check out my Facebook page, we're doing a Me Too Mass. And we also have with us... Wow, a Me Too Mass. That's fantastic. Yeah. I always like respond to your things because I'm like, oh, you're doing such cool things. I need to steal stuff. We're putting the bulletins online in both PDF and Word documents so that people can steal them. Um, and then we're post we're going to be posting not only the archived video online afterwards, but we're going to put up a blog that says why we did the different parts of the service that we did and what like the symbolism is so that any pastor anywhere can modify it for their context. So coming wow. soon, Roswell neighborhood. Me wow. too. I love that. Uh, I am uh, Pastor Daniel Tisdell. Uh, I am the pastor of St. Mark's Lutheran in Roswell, New Mexico. I, I always say like, yes, that Roswell, but I don't know if people, not everybody knows. Anyway, that's a weird thing to me. Anyway. X-Files, it's an X-Files thing. Uh, or, or just a Roswell, I mean, anyway. Um, uh, so uh, we have worship on Sunday at 10.15 a.m. Uh, why 10.15, I don't know, but that's the tradition. Um, and we also have two night. Well, actually, I don't know when people are watch this, but Wednesday nights we have uh, our Lenten service during Lent, and it's Holy Evening Prayer, which is lovely. And the theme that we're embracing during Lent is uh, love. Yay! And how we need to love each other and love ourselves a little bit more. Um, and uh, I'm kind of excited. We're doing a new thing. Um, starting this Friday once a month that is parents night out so we are providing free child care to anybody that wants it they can drop off their kids from 6 to 9 p.m on Friday night and we will have crafts and games and puzzles and coloring and movies and all kinds of fun stuff for them and it's just to sort of serve our serve our neighbors and uh, get to know our neighbors and um, it's exciting so yeah and our website and our Facebook page are both St. Mark's Ro with an S, Roswell, and then the website's .org. So there you go. There you go. Very cool. Yeah. The readings for this Sunday, if you are um, watching this on the virtualgrace.org blog, you'll find the readings down here. If you're finding it somewhere else, this video on YouTube or somewhere else, I'll, I'll try to post the the scripture text in the comment section if it's that kind of platform if you're on facebook you know go to virtualgrace.org and you can watch it there and see the text or just look it up so the first the first find the bible blah blah bible well because we don't always say what verses we're talking about we just like talk about it so i just wanted to you know point that out so this this coming sunday which is i think lent three year c um, the, the first reading is from the 55th chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 9, since Dan said you could look it up. Um, it's, I'm really grateful this Isaiah reading is in this series of three texts because Lenten texts can be very like, hate your body, ignore it, don't eat, um, give everything away. And this, this Isaiah reading is the opposite of that. It's perfect for the timing of like a, a embodied worship service about me too kinds of things, because this is a counter narrative to all those ideas that people took from the grumpiest parts of Paul that talk about like, ignore yourself, you're terrible and wretched. It's okay to hate yourself and to hate your body. This Isaiah reading is, is saying, enjoy good food. Your body is important. Your body was made to be enjoyed through yummy food that you eat, through ways that you delight yourself. Um, and talking about David being someone who was a model of that. And unfortunately, David was a, a perpetrator in several ways. Um, but he was not someone who shied away from sexual intimacy. There are a number of stories of him um, having very diverse kinds of sexual intimacy there it's not certain if he was just 
if he liked Jonathan or if he liked liked Jonathan. It's unclear what his relationship was in that story. There's there's stories about his um, watching someone get into a mikvah bath naked um, in a, a cleansing ritual that women had to partake in each month after their menstruation and then coveting her and um, being in power over her when he had sexual relationships with her and then sending her husband off to be killed at the front of, of the battle line. Um, and then taking, so this, her, then taking her as his wife. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so this, <clears throat> this section of Isaiah is about God delighting um, and enjoying yourself, enjoying the richness of your life uh, with, with a, an attitude that speaks to me these days. All you have to do is go on social me media to find people who are crabby about everything. I feel like we've lost the time when we say, I like this, I don't like this, let's work on making this document better. Instead, um, very often people say, I hate everything about it. Even though there's like a little section that's like, cute little tiny turtles are the best and people have to be fully against it. Um, there is a document that came out in the Lutheran church that has created such um, grumpiness amongst people. Uh, those who appreciate the document have been quiet because of how big the anger is. I'm not taking a stance on that document. I think there's really pr pretty beautiful writing within it. Um, and everything has room for improvement. But what I am, am seeing here that I appreciated with this idea, um, let the wicked forsake their way. Let them, let those who are like up to something, those who are causing their own trouble for one night be stuck in the mud, right? Enjoy your food today. Um, and for this one day, don't worry about the people who are grumpy. Don't worry about the people who can't see hope in the world because God has, God will eventually have mercy on them. Um, but, but for today, like enjoy your cake, right? You can celebrate your birthday even when something terrible is happening because just today, enjoy your body and don't worry. And I, I, th I needed to hear that. And I don't know if anyone else did. And I need to hear that before you go to the next readings because the next readings are pretty <laughs> gnarly. Um, but so that's why I wanna say really strongly up front, enjoy your raisin cakes, right? Enjoy your milk and honey. God wants you to be happy. I, I, um, I, have, to, I have to make an, uh, an apology to someone that you know uh, maybe very few people else would know, and that is Dr. Steve Davidson. Before I say it, I'm about to say I'm sorry, but Isaiah <laughs> is not, because he was my Isaiah teacher, Isaiah is often not my favorite book. Um, it's, it's uh, in a, in a, weirdly, in a historical way, it's a neat book because it, it actually, it, do, it doesn't talk about historical events that much, but it, but there's enough sort of contextual references that it it covers the the and the actual history of of the of the Jewish people over probably a couple hundred years and that's kind of neat as a side but if you it's hard to read because it's very it's a lot of lament it's a lot of um, rep, rep, repetition um, but of all of, of of all the parts of Isaiah I, one of the things that gives always gives me some hope um, is this the part of the end of this passage for my thoughts is, are not your thoughts and nor my ways nor are your ways my ways because i think we always try to put our timing and our um our expectations on on god rather than the other way around and i i we were talking before we broadcast that um the other the uh the the passage from corinthians and the passage from luke are um problematic and difficult to are difficult to read, difficult to preach on, but by having this one verse, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord, makes me go, okay. If I use that as sort of a filter for the other texts, um, it helps me. And I, and I love what you said about, it's, I, I think sometimes people look at, um, 
the Christian life, the Christian faith as trying to be something that's very Spartan, that's very, you know, don't, 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 don't eat a lot of food. Don't, don't have wealth. Don't have fun. Just be, you know, like a monk or a nun in a little cell with, you know, like, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that scripture backs that up. Um, not just here, but in other places, it says, um, very often it says, love, love your life, you know, um, Take joy in your life. Eat, eat well when you can. You, you don't know when, how long that will last. Um, today is, you know, um, live for today. And that, I, I think, um, I don't think we can say that enough because a lot of people, especially during Lent, think that it's all about feeling bad for themselves and feeling guilty and, you know, th thinking that this is a time. And, and some people think that's, that's a Christian way year round. And I, I think there's definitely an idea of moderation sometimes, but also um, there's nothing that say you can't love your life and, and eat, have a good meal. <laughs> yeah, um, and I love, I love the, the way that it talks about it, particularly because I did homeless work for so long and, and eating with the homeless for so long. This idea, like, I love the way it's phrased in the, the canicle can of the turning him, the, the hungry poor shall, weep no more for the food that they can never earn every spear and rod shall be crushed by god and the world is about to turn right this this idea that like i love the way it's phrased it's not phrased in a this isaiah reading is not phrased in a way that makes it clear that the people who are selling food have decided they're not going to take money for it anymore but it just <laughs> declares eat as much as you want and don't pay for it um <laughs> which is kind of a fun little like Hooray! Like the people have taken the things that they need, and justice happened because we just showed up and um, demanded to be fed. Rather, I'm gonna try that at the next time I go out to a restaurant. Yeah, that will go over well. You should. Hey, it says in scripture I should eat what I want and not pay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we don't just only live by two or three verses just in one space. Amen. Mostly what we're doing right now is we're avoiding having to talk about 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 13 because it's one of those mucky yucky texts. If you read 1 Corinthians from the very beginning, you'll realize that it's a text that had to be written because Paul was preaching austerity. He believed Jesus was coming back tomorrow and you could just behave a little bit longer and know you were going to be right with God. Why wouldn't you? Jesus is coming back, right? So what happens in that culture is the women all follow Paul and the men are like, whatever, we got stuff to do. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> so the women decide they want to be celibate because Paul told them to. And there's a number of, of external gospels in the Nag Hammadi text is just a fancy word that means there's lots of gospels, only four of them got chosen in the bound versions of the Bible that we read. There's um, the Acts of Thecla. Thecla was one of the women who chose to be celibate. Um, and her mom actually tried to get her killed because she wouldn't get married. And so there was this problem. Well, the women were following Paul and all of the men still wanted to have a sexuality. And, and so Paul writes for 1 Corinthians as like a pep talk to say, women, if you are married, it would be better if you would have sex with your husbands than for them to go have sex with prostitutes, right? That's the weird place they were in their community because some people were following rules really, really strictly and some people were, so um, Aristotle has this idea that he talks about, it's called the golden mean right? The golden mean is the idea that there are people who do too much of something. They overindulge. So too much of anything is bad. Too much drinking is bad. Too much eating is bad. Too much reading is bad. Too much um, war is bad. And then on the other extreme, abstaining from things is bad. So if you don't ever drink, you can't have a, a philosophical aha moment at a party, right? If you don't ever go to war, then bad things will happen to you. And so Aristotle's idea is that the pursuit of our life, the ethical work that we are to do, this is in the, the Nicomachean ethics for people who know how to spell that and look it up on Google. Um, <laughs> the idea is that our job is to always try to find the sweet spot in the middle. 
between overindulgence and underindulgence. And in, in different spheres of our life, that sweet spot might like look different, right? So my sweet spot for how much war I'm going to engage in is different than someone else's sweet spot who lives in Syria. The sweet spot for how much food I'm going to eat is different than people who um, have the metabolism of a high schooler. The sweet spot of how much company you're going to have with strangers and how often you're going to go to parties is going to be different based on your neurocognitive ideas about um, whether or not being around other people is pain or joy, right? So people's sweet spots is very different, but that our pursuit in life is to try to find that middle place. So this writing by Paul comes after that. Everybody knew Aristotle's ideas. Paul's trying to do something new. He's saying, okay, sure, you could find the sweet spot. The sweet spot is impossible to find because you think you got it just right and then your metabolism changes or you think you got it just right and um, you, know, you start working the late shift and it's hard to find that sweet spot in the romantic spice of your marriage, right? You think you've got it right and then the world shifts. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of ethical work to try to always be figuring out what's the sweet spot in tough love or letting your kids have everything. What's the sweet spot? That involves a lot of thinking. You always question yourself. So instead of that, let's just abstain from everything until Jesus comes back, right? And so he's trying to figure out how to navigate the the social consequences of that and trying to really, he's trying to bury his own shame because we know Paul has something called like the thorn in his side that he believes he has something that he did in his past that was so sinful he doesn't think one ought to be like forgiven from it. So he's trying to overdo because he's feeling shameful. So in this text, where it's talking about a giant group of people who die because of their sexual immorality, there are places where our contemporary society reads that to be gay people. Gay people are added to the Bible in the King James edition because King James was bisexual and they thought it was a good way to tell the king they didn't like him without getting their heads cut off, right? So each generation has picked a different Thing they thought the sexual immorality was most likely what this is talking about is the fact that there are there are arguments now that most of the plagues that happened in Egypt were sexually transmitted diseases right boils all kinds of things like that this is the equivalent of a PSA a bunch of people got frisky and then they died and got sick right if you want to get your sex ed from a guy who has pledged celibacy, you are welcome to read 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and take that advice. If you instead would like to get your sex ed from health experts or from people who know about um, what works in terms of the things that you're trying to avoid when you're trying to have safer sex, then get your, your sexuality education from those kinds of people. I have decided to, ex to not read this text at all on Sunday. We're reading a contemporary reading about how fig plants grow. And I'll tell you more about that when we talk about the Luke reading. But I thought I would pause and let Pastor Dan say some words if you had some more things you wanted to say about 1 Corinthians. Oh, I can't hear you. Bum, 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 bum. Sorry. I go. had muted because someone came and rang the doorbell and I didn't answer it. So oh. I didn't see a way that I could do that. And there's a golden middle. Some you can't answer the doorbell all the time, and you can't right. never answer the the doorbell. Right. You gotta find the sweet spot. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> I um. So the way I the part of the way that I prepare to preach is I read all of the texts early in the week, and I read them multiple times. Um, I read them in multiple places. Sometimes I read them um, louder or softer um different different um 
just it's just my own process. I try to sort of um, consume the words. And my problem is I usually start with the gospel rather than the other texts. Mm -hmm. And I work through the other texts. What I've noticed with this is um, if you start with the Old Testament text and then work into the epistle and then to the gospel, sometimes the connections that you make within the texts are different if, if you do it the other direction. Um, I usually read the gospel first. So um, already in this Bible study, and in a, I did another text study earlier this week, the... Um, Overachiever. I know. The uh, <laughs> Isaiah text, like I'm getting more out of it because I'm starting with the Isaiah, if that makes any sense. Yep. And the Corinthians text, I'm less offended by because I started today with that rather than with the gospel. So yeah. I'm going to sort of, rather than just talking about 1 Corinthians for a second, I want to explain why 1 Corinthians was so offensive the first time I read it. Yeah. Because if you read it by itself, there's a couple of things that are eh, a little icky, but they're really icky if you... So, so I've said many times when I preach, I've said times here that um, the way that the lectionary is has been picked out um, sometimes is brilliant and sometimes is a little weird. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that you can usually find a common thread between all of the texts, including the Psalm, though we rarely talk about the Psalm. And I like so, the Psalm this week. It's one of my favorites. I do, I do too, actually. So if you, if you read the Luke text um, and the, um, the, the, the part about the, first of all, a fig tree planted a vineyard was confusing to me in the first place, but I'm sure you have commentary about that, so I'll save that for later. But then it says, so the fig tree, the fig tree is not bearing fruit, and um, the gardener presumably is is uh, Jesus. And it says, well, let's rather than cutting it down, let's just go one more one more year, and we'll take care of it. I'll dig around, I'll put manure on it, and then maybe it'll bear fruit next year. Um, and then it says, if not, you can cut it down. So as a preacher, I start with that, and I say, okay, where are what are the connections here? Why is, why is, um, who am I in here? Am I, am I the fig tree? If I'm not, am, am I providing good fruit or am I not, am I, am I not producing good fruit? And if I'm not, what does it mean to be cut down, cut out of community, remove what, whatever you read that first. And then you go to the Corinthians and you mm -hmm. read a passage like, um, we must not indulge in, indulge in sexual morality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. Then you go, oh, Jesus is saying, behave or you're, or you're going to be killed. Mm -hmm. um, if you start with Isaiah work to Corinthians work to the gospel, I think you get a different, yeah. a different take. But because I started with the gospel, I look at that and I go, Huh. Is Jesus advocating? See, I, I tend to lean, and this is um, even people, many people within my own denomination that agree with me on this, but I tend to lean more universalist. I think God loves everyone. And I think we have that, I think we share that in common, at least we have here, that God loves everyone. And not just those who 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 love God back or or who 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 claim to be Christian. I think God loves everyone. And so this you don't bear good fruit, then uh, cut down, especially if we're talking about related to sexual relation, then it's even more problematic. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I like the way the connections are made, um, but I think you have to be careful how you make those connections. Yeah, uh, and I, I don't know if people have noticed, but when I do Bible study that doesn't suck, I don't always go the same order with the text, but I always try to do a text sandwich. So whatever text is yucky, I put in the middle because <laughs> the people who are just going to watch the build at the beginning and leave, I want them to hear words of good news. People who are going to watch all the way to the end, I want to end with good news and hope for them. And so I put the yuck in the middle typically. Can I, I'm going to make one more comment about Luke and then yeah. just because, um, so sort of put a put a, a cherry on this sort of connection. You when I put a cherry on a fig tree. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> to put a fig on this conversation. <laughs> um, 
I, I think even the Luke passage can be read two different ways. Yes. Um, and I make, and I make, I've made the case, and I've heard other people make the case that especially in the last, in the rise of fundamentalism, which has only been about a hundred years or so, um, in our in the U.S., um, I think more and more politics is defining faith. And we're coming to the point where we don't have Christianity of Christianities. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not even talking about different denominations. I think even some that some we would call, you know, big box churches actually have some some of them have really good theology and some of yeah. them some what we call mainline churches have really good theology and some of them don't. So it's not about it's not about what you think it is on the on the more surface level. But I, I, I read this two ways. And I think those Christianities read those read this very very different. Um, I read that as so. Um, if anybody from my church watches this, they're going to get it. They're going to get a preview of my sermon for Sunday. <laughs> but yeah, stop watching now. So otherwise, the sermon will be ruined forever. You're not going to hear this. Yeah, my <laughs> sometimes I'll have like a. I don't always do this because it's a little cliche, but sometimes I'll have like a personal analogy from my own life, and and um, I kept thinking about. How when I was a kid, I went to a church camp and we'd, I would go hiking. And when you're like nine, you know, anything over a mile is a really long way. And mm -hmm. so when you're like 10 miles, after about a mile, every one of the kids is going, how much farther, how much farther, how much farther. And they must have been in their training because every year, every counselor says about a mile, just about a mile. It didn't matter if you were 10 miles off or a half, it was, about, it was always about a mile. And once you ask three times, you realize that they weren't going to give you a straight answer. And they may not even know. It's about a mile. Yeah. And I'm going to use that as a sort of a thing in my sermon. Um, and I think, I like to think that's what's going on here in this parable. And what I mean by that is, um, presumably the owner of the vineyard is, is in, in Jesus's parable is, is God, is God the Father, the Creator, right? And for three years, I've come looking for fruit in this fig tree. It's fruit. So this person is not producing good fruit. Cut it down. And Jesus says, no, give me just one more year. I'll take care of it. And then next year, if it's, if it's not bearing fruit, you can cut it down. And my thought is, a year passes, and God says, time to cut that down. Oh, wait, just give me one more year, just one more mile. I think every year, the gardener says, because the gardener is Jesus, just give me one more year, one more mile, just one more. And, and that, that care is always there. That we're always, this is a churchy word, but we're always being interceded for yeah. every year. This isn't a one-time deal. That's how I read that. Unfortunately, That's a good sermon. Thank you. Uh, I, it's not good other, gardening, but it's a good the sermon. The other way of reading this, though, which is an entirely valid, and to make sure that I say this is an entirely valid way of reading this, is that if people aren't doing the right things, they need to be cut out of community or they need to be, they, if, if they are uh, not a good person, um, they're going to hell. They're gonna be cut down and cast on the fire. I don't like that, that's not my, that's not my theology. But I know people, I know I can name names, I know people that read this and would see that. This is, yeah. this is Jesus justifying the good people get in and the bad people don't. Yeah. And I, um, between the, the ickiness of the, of the Corinthians and the fact that this can be read two ways and people in my congregation, there'll be people who will, who will, both types of people who will read it both types of ways in my congregation makes this a very sticky, even without Corinthians, it makes a very sticky text. Um, well, there's, there's a third way. Oh, great. There's a third way, and it's it's from the historical critical understanding. Historical critical is just a way of saying like looking at other texts and the history around what's going on. Um, one one so, so to answer your question about why someone would plant a fig tree in a vineyard, that's a that's a question that you can get from the musical Hamilton. Really? Yeah. I, everyone will sit under their own vine and fig tree. Yes. Which is from, uh, which is from uh, Psalms. George Washington wants to resign um, as president. 
it comes from first kings okay and there's a promise that when you reach the promised land every single man gets their own vine and their own fig tree and so jesus is talking about this text that is about everyone receiving enough to eat and um about the what it's like when the messiah is around and what it's like in the promised land so that's one part of what's happening is this is a story about um someone being given all the tools they need to have enough food and then wanting to chop the tree down but i think that the reason it's written in this way is because luke was smarter than mark luke was a doctor right so in mark's gospel jesus is a terrible gardener a terrible farmer every metaphor that is about <laughs> farming in the gospel of mark is terrible advice jesus in the gospel of mark says let the weeds and the wheat grow together well if you did that the wheats would be so devoid of nutrients that it wouldn't actually be food right jesus in the gospel of mark says um all kinds of all kinds of silly things in the gospel of mark jesus comes by a fig tree when it was not the season a fig tree would be fruitful and then kills the fig tree just because he's mad because he doesn't know that it's not the season that a fig tree is and even like the next day the disciples go check and yep it's dead <laughs> they're like what you know everyone's like why did he do that right <laughs> is an is a an ancient metaphor of jerusalem it's a foreshadowing that jerusalem is going to be destroyed that the temple will be destroyed right but jesus is a terrible gardener fig trees after you plant them could take as much as three to five years to bear fruit however fig trees also need a male and a female near them so a fig tree that's not blooming it could be because it's a baby plant it's brand new like the the followers of jesus who might have been um, unfamiliar with jewish traditions and rituals it could have taken them some time to kind of really understand what's going on um, it could have been that just a lone fig tree in the middle of a vineyard didn't get properly planted with both the male and the female parts that have to be able to you know blow into the wind to each other to make the fruits happen and so luke is giving the proper answer. If someone wants to cut down their fig tree three years in, they're dumb. You know, because <laughs> fig trees bloom, like why would you cut it down at the time? Like you've waited the longest part of the time, but you can't wait another year for the season that it would normally take for this fig tree to like grow figs. So there wouldn't even be a question about maybe this fig tree isn't going to bloom in the next year it's really just about knowing how long it takes for a fig tree to have a fair shot right, right? um and and giving it a chance to like have additional nutrients and and manure is giving this fig tree a real shot in an actual farming way and so i honestly think that this is a way to try to tell that same story but without jesus looking stupid to the farmers who are nearby I also, I, like I also read I read that um, oftentimes vineyards would have some fig trees in them um, intentionally that that I, I, I didn't I didn't read the entire thing but they were they would so they, parts of them would have support they would support the vines but also it would be it was sort of a uh, like a rotation of crop situation mm -hmm. that because of the way figs worked and grapes worked at that time that they were people would raise both. So they would never have, they would always have a crop at, they would provide food at different times, basically. It's a better sermon to say, give them just one more year, right? But I wonder if this is just one of the places where Luke was showing off that he was a doctor. <laughs> Honestly, because yeah. have you ever been at a party with that person where you like say something you think is clever and they're like, well, actually, figs only grow after the fourth year. And you're like, now I feel dumb. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I like the idea that Luke is just as human and frail as we are, right? And that's beautiful and worthy of being a sacred storyteller in in God's. Yeah, but we but we do story. have to preach on this, so I guess we don't have to preach on that. I could. Nah, <laughs> you got to talk for a long time, and you don't have to talk about that. <laughs>
no. <laughs> but I want to get to Psalm 63 because Psalm 63 is one of my favorites. I think I memorized this when I was in high school. And how I ironic was, I mentioned that we don't that we don't always talk about the Psalms and then Yeah. How dare you? My fault. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to read it. I don't even need to talk about it. I just think it's really beautiful. Like, oh god, is, you are my god. Eagerly I seek you. Mm -hmm. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land. There is no water. Hey, let's do alternate birds just like in churches. <laughs> That's right. Therefore, I have gazed upon you in your holy place that I might behold your power and glory. For your steadfast love is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So I will bless you as long as I live and lift up my hands in your name. My spirit is content. When's the last time you could say that? My spirit is content as with the richest of foods, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches. Can you imagine if the thing that, that you weren't kept awake at night by worries, instead you got to just give thanks to God? That'd be awesome. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My whole being clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. Right? That's awesome. You know, I, I, the psalm has helped me think that um, there, there's, a, there's sort of a separate, another theme about, because it even mentioned here, as with the richest of foods, and, you know, mm -hmm. pra praising, uh, praising when there is enough to eat, and, yeah. and life is good, and understanding that God's timing means sometimes that won't be the case. Yeah. Um, a lot like the fig tree right? Yeah. Uh, that um, praise when it's time to praise and eat when it's time to eat and, and mourn when it's time to mourn yep. and it's time for everything under the season, Ecclesiastes 3, uh, right. which, I, which I quoted last week, so I can't quote it again this week. Nah. Except for on the Bible study, you can. Yeah. <laughs> I can well, and that. I think too, like, like there have been so many deaths and so much cancer and so many mass shootings that we, we have such a long list of things that we need help with that we don't get to the point sometimes in our prayers of the people to be able to have the gratitude moments. And so um, last, last Sunday, I asked people at church to spend at least one week only saying nice things online. No judgments, no criticisms, an entire week of only nice things that they say or thanks. And people will notice. Trust I could me. be better at that personally. We all can. We all can. And, and my feed might be really positive this last year, but it's because of the things I had the, the strength to delete, <laughs> not because of any sort of different moral fortitude that I have than other people. And so I just want other people to join me because the number one thing that I hear is how often people want to disconnect from social connections because of all the negativity that's happening in the world. And so if we're going to be the people of good news, Let's be the people of good news. Well, and, and I, it goes to um, praying for your enemy. You know, like, um, I, I've, if you're a Facebook friend of mine, you know that I, I will post some political things sometimes. And you I get, do. I get you're not afraid to be angry about stuff. I get frustrated and angry about things often. But I, I have, I have, refra I can't say I've refrained, but I've been cutting back just because, A, it's not going to solve anything. It just makes people angrier. Um, and I've learned that from my own self that there's people that I admire that post very opposite things and I want to say you can't and I'm like well I'm doing the same thing right yeah. so uh, trying to post more loving caring things yep. um, even when I'm frustrated and angry is hard but I think it's for the betterment of, of everybody because I'm not going to do it forever I'm not going to change be a people day when Nazis do dumb things and you have to be <laughs> against them right but <laughs> right. You could pick a week and try and just see how it feels to pick a week and try. Uh, it's interesting you pick Nazis, but anyway, I'm just going to gloss uh, over Because it. it's typically the, like one universal thing everyone can be against. We're not certain. We can't agree on both sides who is a metaphor like Nazis, but most people can agree to be against the Nazis. That, uh, okay, good. I'm <laughs> glad you worded it that way. Yeah, down with Anti-Semitism is not good. Right. That too. That's another thing. Yeah, no kidding. So, well, I mean, I know, I, I know this is technically not for me, but I feel a little better about my sermon now. Yay!
you can do it. I posted on social media today that if anyone needs a cheerleader, that I, I would be their cheerleader. And I, I just want you to know, Dan, you're good enough. You're smart enough. And a lot of people them. like you. <laughs> your, your, your child care program is going to be awesome. Yeah, up to that point, you were quoting Saturday Night Live. So now we're going. I know. I took a turn. Yeah. I, took a turn. I think you, you got this. <laughs> I will, I will, I will admit what I, something I said before, uh, before we broadcast that, that these, I, I'm still, uh, um, I've been a, I, I, I've been through the cycle of, of text only one full time. So this is my second time through the text. And this is one of the hardest groups of text to preach it on that yeah. I've had. So, um, yeah. yeah, there's, there's, there's some doozies in there. It sort of depends on how how deep you're willing to get with the text. That's right. Uh, so, so if you've ever wondered if pastors have parts of the Bible they're allowed to not like, this is Pastor Dan's part he doesn't like. There are parts I don't like. And I yes. admitted that I don't always like Isaiah, even though Dr. Steve did. I like Isaiah, it's the best. You, you but think, I like Mark and it's Do you think Steve watches this though? He uh, might. I don't know. Who knows? He's gonna, he's gonna let me know. <laughs> you already apologized, it should be fine. It's Lent. It, it, yes, true. Anyway. <laughs> well, everyone out there, if you need a cheerleader, I love you. I'm rooting for you. I support you. Heck, you made it to, to 52 minutes into this video. You definitely um, are the best of the best. And I don't care who doesn't think so. Yeah, I know, right? Hi, I mean, Dan's put, mom. Putting up with my rambling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're always greeting my mom. Well... <laughs> She always watches it. She watches it. That's right. The, will she watch to the end? Probably. We'll yeah. find out. <laughs> we will. Well, take, take care, everybody. We love you, and you're awesome. See you later.